welcome to Leaders Recon, where we discuss leadership, warrior skills, and other unique opportunities within the G3 Leader Development Branch. I'm your host, Joshua Carr, and today we're discussing the State Partnership Program with an expert, Mr. Russell Galetti. Sir, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. So, you work at the State Department now, um, but you're also a guardsman. Uh, you know, which state do you come from? And yeah, I am, uh, and it's important to note that I'm, I'm here in my civil servant capacity for the Department of State. I'm a GS there, and I'm a traditional guardsman back in Ohio. Uh, so I've been with the Ohio National Guard for 22 and a half years now, uh, enlisted an officer, uh, and then I live and work in Washington, D.C., and uh, I'm a full-time civil servant for the Department of State. So you get to balance a little bit, but I guess you've seen both sides of things then, because you have a neat, unique perspective from the SPP program, or the State Partnership Program, I guess, for those who are not familiar with the acronym. Um, from the State Department perspective, but then I'm sure you interacted with your state partner as well as a guardsman. Oh yeah, it's been great. Um, in my M-Day capacity, I deployed with the Hungarian army uh, for six months of training alongside the Hungarian army in Hungary. Uh, and then together, as it was called an operational mentor and liaison team, and um, there were a number of them in the 2000s, 2010s, uh, and then together, 28 Americans and 28 Hungarians, we deployed to Afghanistan together, and the 56 of us trained, a, trained advised, and assisted a battalion of Afghan National Army infantry. Uh, and we were the third rotation of that. And I think it ultimately yielded like um, 10 rotations. So to have that SPP experience, you know, in my back, in my back pocket, coming to Washington D.C. and now working on the program, at more at the national strategic level for the State Department, um, is invaluable because I. I'm kind of the chief salesman for the SPP uh, within the Department of State. Yeah, I was going to ask you, sir, what's the what's your actual title over there in the section before we dive into the SPP program itself? Sure, uh, I'm a strategic planner. So um, my working title is strategic planner. My actual title is foreign affairs officer. Uh, and so there's a small team within the Bureau of Political Military Affairs and we focus on the integration of diplomatic equities um, and concerns into what remain fundamentally military plans. So we all have a strategic planning portfolio uh, on my team. I have CENTCOM and SOCOM military plans, uh, but then we also have, we each have a Title X authority that we have to kind of coordinate around the department. Uh, and so some of them have, you know, some of my partners have 312 theater cooperation activities, uh, 1202 support to your regular warfare, um, we refer to these all by their section in the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, or the um, uh, U.S. Code. But I ended up, just through sheer luck, with 341, the State Partnership Program. So every time uh, DOD needs anything from the State Partnership Program through State Department, I get to you know, chat up our desk officers about it, route it through our department, get our Assistant Secretary's signature on it, um, and, and basically be kind of the focal point in state for SPP. Well, and that's one of the things that really surprised me when we did a site visit at the State Department was like the State Department compared to DOD is such a small entity. Um, so it feels like everyone has like such a big portfolio um, while they're there um, as compared to DOD, which is like a huge monstrosity of an organization. It is. And, you know, that's it's kind of a chief complaint is, you know, Compared to DOD, every agency feels themselves to be very under-resourced and small, uh, but DOD has such a wide variety of missions, everything from the nuclear triad down to you know security cooperation programming in developing countries uh, and running schools, PXs, hospitals, bowling alleys. Um, you, you just really can't compare apples to oranges. Uh, however, you know, State Department, I think, only has about 12,000 foreign service officers, and those are our diplomats who go around the world and represent and negotiate on behalf of the United States with other countries, uh, and then about another 12,000 um, civil servants uh, supporting them, and those are kind of like uh, equivalent to warrant officers. Uh, they are the technical functional specialists who, like me, focus on one specific portfolio for a longer duration. Uh, and so, um, yeah, it is a very, very different kind of bureaucratic organizations and um, perspectives that we that we approach the world with. So taking that perspective then I guess what is uh so can you give us an overview I guess of the SPP program itself? Um, I know I think it started we were talking earlier in 1993. Sure yeah. Um, so yeah uh, state partnership program is it's fundamentally a DOD program uh, so we coordinate um, as directed by law with DOD on their execution and implementation of the state partnership program. Uh, it comes from Title X of the U.S. Code, Section 341, and it's a security cooperation program 
um, that focuses on um, military to military security engagement in support of defense goals. Uh, and then kind of auxiliary to that, uh, you get into a lot of um, cultural exchange, mm -hmm. educational exchange, whole society exchanges between you know, states and uh, partner countries. Um, but uh, fundamentally, it's a DOD security cooperation program that we in the Department of State uh, pro provide concurrence or coordination on. Um, it started during the, it has its roots in the late 80s, early 90s with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Um, by, you know, by 1992, with all these countries kind of leaving the Soviet Union, um, the United States realized that it could no longer kind of approach engagement with the Soviet Union as one unitary mm -hmm. political body, and so had to establish contact and liaison with all these other countries again, reestablish in some cases. Um, and so, you know, to, to provide familiarity contact, liaison, um, avoid any, you know, miscalculation uh, between between European countries uh, or between the United States and former Soviet states. And so uh, U.S.-European Command at that time set up what was called the Joint Contact Team Program, uh, which just took, uh, I think, language trained officers and special forces officers uh, who already existed within European Command and I think 10th Special Forces Group um, and established liaison officers uh, primarily in, I want to say, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary uh, in 1992. And then by 1993, the National Guard Bureau provided uh, or um, proposed uh, the state partnership program, um, which then started pairing individual U.S. states with uh, individual European countries. Um, and my state, Hungary and Ohio, uh, being you know one of the first partnerships uh, established in 1993. Uh, by 1997, this is a quote that I, I made sure to pull out, but there's a joint staff history on the state partnership program, uh, and it said by 1997, um, citizen soldiers provided an excellent model for the democratization of the military and provided a compelling example for the use of part-time military to meet national defense uh, needs. So um, already by the 90s, we were kind of modeling, this is what an all-volunteer force can do for you, uh, and this is what using a trained, professional, and ready reserve component can do for you. So that's pretty cool. So then that's where, you know, I, I know a lot of Guardsmen are like vaguely familiar with their partnership programs, but they've been evolving quite a bit. So you mentioned that you kind of started in Europe and UCOM there with the, you know, dissolution of the Soviet Union. What's, and it's expanded quite substantially now. Do you know what the, where we're at today? Yeah, it's, uh, it's expanded to 82, I think 82 partnerships in um, all 54 states and territories. Uh, some U.S. states have Many U.S. states have multiple partners, and some countries, uh, by you know, for whatever reason, have multiple U.S. states as partners, uh, and it's growing. I want to say um, U.S. Southern Command, every country uh, has a SPP partner within U.S. Southern Command. Um, so Southcom and UCOM are very well established, uh, and we're already growing our numbers. And every combatant command has a few state partnership program partners. Uh, even Northcom has uh, Bahamas and Rhode Island, um, but uh, it's growing in AFRICOM, uh, US, U.S. Africa Command, U.S. Central Command, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, um, which some of those uh, some of those theaters, um, you know, we're really looking forward to expanding our competitive posture um, and building alliances and partnerships. Well, and that brought me right to my next question, which, like, as a strategic principle, I guess, what you know, from your position over in the State Department, I understand it's a DoD program, but like. What is the purpose of state partnership programs with, you know, these various countries around the world? I think more than just the, you know, the military to military engagement that, um, you know, the National Guard Bureau says is the purpose of state partnership program. Uh, it does provide continuity of partnership that we see. What we see when we look at the state partnership program from State Department is that continuity, that it's not a random, you know, military unit kind of cycling in and out to do a, um, a joint exercise and training um, program or, a, you know, a metal, uh, medical civil action program. Um, it is officers and enlisted personnel from one state that will meet state partnership program partners in their partner country very early on in their careers by going through you know combined exercises um, by deploying together like I did 
um, by coming to the United States and going to um, non-commissioned officer education system schools. Uh, and then they'll grow up together over the course of you know 20 or 30 years uh, in the guard, hopefully. Um, some of our state guards are larger than some of their partner countries' militaries and um, you know, just more advanced because we have such a well-funded, well-equipped, well-trained reserve component in the United States. Uh, it's, a, um, it's an economy uh, of force for us uh, that we are able to fund, train, and equip our reserve component. Um, and so being able to kind of stand on par with your SPP partner country um, who, you know, they are professional full-time military personnel um, that's that's an incredible thing that other countries, our, our chief competitors, cannot do. Uh, so it's it's that continuity, uh, it's long-term consistent engagement, um, and it's also what I see also when I look at SPP from the State Department is a whole society approach. That mill-to-mill -mill engagement is just the start, and ideally you want to get to a place where you're connecting colleges across you know across oceans, you're connecting governors to prime ministers, uh, you're connecting um, you know, state cabinet level departments to ministries um, to grow economic ties, educational ties, cultural ties, things like, like that. It, seem, it seems like it's a lot about the building those like fundamental relationships like over time. Because um, I mean, I, I know you mentioned earlier, like we have diplomats and State Department people moving in and out of positions all the time. But in theory, these relationships that you develop, like for example, with the folks you deployed with um, from Hungary, eventually, uh, can mature over years. Oh yeah, you you see, you know, after you know the individual guard states are kind of such small ecosystems. Sometimes it's still larger than their partner country military. Sometimes, but also, you know, the same ten thousand soldiers kind of cycling through the same community over the course of a career. It's it's very easy that um, or very likely that you'll see company commanders battalion commanders, brigade commanders, and then, you know, ATAGs, assistant adjutant generals and adjutant generals grow up together throughout the course of their careers with, you know, people who are also going through that hierarchy on their, in their military career, in their country. Um, and so uh, by ideally, by the time you're a, you know, a brigade staff officer or a wing commander or, you know, an ATAG or a TAG, um, you're very well familiar with all the, you know, the brigade commanders and division commanders and and general staff in your partner country, and you know you, you've not just had initial exchanges, but your your kids play together. You you know vacation together. You you know you, you know each other's families. Um, that's that's the I think advantage of having that long term, consistent mill to mill engagement with like like communities that get to know each other over time um, and deploy and fight together. So then I guess shifting from that relationship piece over, I know, you know, the national defense strategy has us focused on this, like, great power competition model. Um, how does SPP, you know, work in concert with that? I think it provides an American presence, um, even in combatant commands and regions of the world where they don't traditionally get U.S. military posture. Um, you know, some combatant commands will never get a carrier strike group or an armor brigade combat team, um, but they will get, you know, a state partnership program partner with every single country in their command. Um, and so it lets us kind of be everywhere, um, which then sometimes puts our competitors on their back foot, makes them have to cover down, um, makes them have to perk up and take notice of what we're doing, uh, and signals to not just our partners, but our competitors that there's no partner or ally in the world that we take for granted. Um, so in that way, it you know, for such a little investment, um, it provides all those things. Uh, and also, um, I think the ability of um, putting different parts of the world that traditionally have not been in play in competition with our chief uh, competitors um, by getting engineers out to places to conduct assessments of airfields um, by just using, you know, battalions or brigades exercises as, you know, either dynamic force employments uh, or to validate um, kind of some of our planning assumptions. You know, can, can we fit a brigade in that island? Uh, can we get a brigade there quickly enough? 
Um, all those things uh, helps us kind of refine our plans at the national strategic level um, and, and kind of increases the options that we have available for things like access spacing and overflight, um, gives us greater fidelity on running estimates to where, yes, this country has said to the, you know, the brigade commander, the tag of this state that, you know, the, the partnership's so good that we'll give you access spacing and overflight if you ask us, or, you know, we, we, the United States is our security partner of choice. Like that's kind of where we, that's aspirational. And that's where we want to get to um, with, you know, so many of these partnerships. So I guess another thing that I've heard on, you know, talking about the strategic level planning and stuff is the acronym DIME. I'm sure a lot of us have heard about, a little bit about that, right? D diplomatic, uh, military, or informational, military, economic, because it sounds like a little bit like the state partnership program here is merging some of those pieces together almost um, with the military to military engagement, but then also you know, the informational or maybe diplomatic piece. I guess, what are some of your thoughts on that? Ideally, um, that's, I mean, so the taxpayers pay for a security cooperation program. That's what the law says. Uh, but ideally, it does lead to um, a lot more of those things. Um, obviously, the, the program itself, and that's the difference between an instrument and a element of national power. Um, the instrument is kind of the extant capability. It's what you have to use. Uh, the element is kind of more latent potential. It's iron in your mountains that can be turned into tanks uh, or export goods, right? Um, but it's an instrument that can affect all the different elements um, because it is, it does have diplomatic effects. It is a desirable program that we want to extend to select partners and allies in the world, um, which then I think earns us favor with them and builds stronger ties with them. Uh, so it has an effect on the diplomatic element of national power certainly has an effect on the informational element of national power um, by just facilitating cultural exchange by bringing partners to the United States, you know, for NCOES schools. But then they, you know, we take them on tours of our museums. We take them on tours of our state houses. Uh, we take them to baseball games and basketball games. Um, and over time, they get exposed to, you know, American society and culture. Uh, and so and, and vice versa. The reverse is true as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, military, that's obvious. It's the security cooperation. It's building uh, lowercase BPC, building partner, you know, uh, capacity or capability. Um, it's validating and, and working towards interoperability uh, so that when we have to join a military coalition with some of these partners and allies, we already know how to work together. Uh, and then economic, um, again, aspirational, but every time we, you know, connect our commerce and trade departments in the different states to those commerce and trade militaries or uh, uh, ministries um, or uh, every time we kind of facilitate a connection between an American business uh, and kind of get them in better integrated into foreign markets. Um, that's obviously not the in the law and that's not the purpose of the SPP, but that's a advantage that it's know, like a byproduct. Yeah, sometimes grows out of it. That's so interesting. And then then like so dime is it's a it's a mnemonic device that kind of came up in the mid you know twentieth century um, Hans Morgenthau and uh, AFK uh, Organsky um, are I think the most famous um, who coined it um, but there's also if you check out joint doctrine note I think it's a one dash eighteen from April eighteen uh, published okay. by the joint staff called strategy. Um, it actually kind of advances a concept called midfield instead of dime. Uh, it always changes, um, but it you know discusses. It, it's a I guess an analytical tool that you can look through um, not just diplomatic, informational, military, and economic. The the dime you know we also have dime fill, um, but military, informational, diplomatic, finance, uh, intelligence, economic, law, and development. So there's a lot of different um, kind of tools that you can use to to look at the different dimensions of a, um, a program or a partnership. On that note, like what, what does, so, you know, we always talk about the national defense strategy over here in DOD, you know, does the state department have a, you know, similar governing type document or what is that? We, uh, we do, um, approaches to strategy, I think vary by department. Um, the military, Different parts of different agencies too have kind of more of a dogmatic adherence to strategic documents, um, which uh, can be good, but can also be kind of constraining yourself. Um, 
So we all fall under the national security strategy, which is you know signed by the president and published by the National Security Council. Um, but then, in, in from time to time, we've had, you know, DoD has the Quadrennial Defense Review, which is a four-year program that I think is is prescribed by law, kind of a report to Congress on capabilities, opportunities, weaknesses. Um, uh, we at state and the U.S. Agency for International Development, which is an independent sub-cabinet agency that falls under the broad foreign policy guidance of the Department of State, um, we used to have the quadrennial diplomatic and development review. So kind of a, a like product. Um, but we also have a joint strategic plan that we publish in um, coordination with the Depart uh, U.S. Agency for International Development. Um, we have, and, and this kind of gets at uh, I call it a disjuncture that exists between state and DOD, where you know DOD has their Office of the Secretary of Defense, uh, the Office of the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, um, that provides policy direction for you know all the military departments, all the you know eighteen some defense agencies under the DOD, all the combatant commands. Um, so they provide that policy guidance. But then you have the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who's the global integrator of military plans, right? And that was directed by Secretary Mattis. The chairman, now General Milley, is the um, global integrator. Uh, and there's a number of processes that kind of integrate global military plans to make sure that they're aligned with all these different strategic documents. Mm -hmm. We don't really, at State Department, have a global integrator. Um, the, the role of the Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs, who owns all of our regional bureaus um, and the Bureau for International Organizations, uh, varies from administration to administration and, you know, secretary to secretary. Um, but then the real disjuncture comes, the chief of mission authority, every single ambassador in the field is the president's personal representative to that country. So where in the DOD, the combatant commander is the joint force commander. They have unified, unified action um, for the entire combatant command and they can just draw a joint operational area and it, doesn't have to respect international boundaries, um, you know, if that's part of the military plan or um, if that's what's needed. Uh, every single chief of mission, you know, is the president's personal representative. And so the documents that matter, I think most, the most, the strategic documents that matter most in the State Department end up being the integrated country strategies. Mm -hmm. That's where the ambassador brings together all the different representatives of instruments of national power in the embassy. So. DOD legal attaché from justice, um, you know, financial attachés or you know, commercial attachés, um, homeland security representatives in the country team. They bring them together, and they publish the integrated country strategy for that country. Uh, so you can see 180 or 190 integrated country strategies. Um, it's difficult to kind of meld those into a regional or global yeah. approach. Uh, and so, from my perspective. That's that's something that we're still working on across the interagency is kind of how do we best, how do we rework any processes that we're using right now and how do we best apply the strategic documents that we have and can expect from, you know, this new administration into something that's better suited for competition globally hmm. for agencies that, you know, what, what we do at the, United, uh, the Department of State we see that we're, we're doing competition all the time. Competition is not a thing we do. Competition is just the normal conduct of diplomacy and, and engagement with partners, allies, and competitors, uh, or adversaries even. Um, and so how, when one side is talking competition and the other side believes itself to be doing competition, um, we, we kind of need to create a wiring harness in the middle to connect different parts of those efforts. Uh, together as best we can. Yeah, so I mean, that was a lot of information, sir. But um, I guess, you know, we've kind of beat around the bush a little bit, but like diving right into, you know, how some of these, you know, partnerships are impacting our global relationships. You hit on something which, you know, I was going to ask here, which is, you know, every partnership's unique. Do you have some examples you want to give us of a partnership that has grown, you know, from inception to this point now? Sure. Um, I, I definitely I would be remiss if I didn't mention my state's partnerships with um, Hungary, Hungary since 1993 and Serbia since 2005. Um, we exercise regularly together. Um, we have deployed to combat together with the Hungarians. Um, we um, have connected Ohio businesses to 
foreign markets uh, through our engagements. Uh, and we've uh, even, I think we're in the process of establishing cultural exchanges, uh, either either cooperative degree programs or um, you know collaborative efforts between universities. Which is that's kind of what you mentioned was like the end state, you know, of a fully functional partnership program. Exactly, ideally, like that's that's where I want to see it to go because I think I think the state partnership program is one of the best ways to bring um, our states and partner countries together, focused on starting with military to military cooperation, but then growing. The potential is always there for it to grow. Um, you know, based on conditions on the ground. But uh, I, I think another great example is the Iowa-Kosovo uh, partnership, where um, I think I think Kosovo actually established a consulate in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, which is, you know, like, I don't know how many Kosovars live in, you know, yeah, Iowa, yeah, sure. but uh, that's, that's a huge reciprocation of that commitment um, that you don't always see is the establishment of a consulate. Uh, and really cool is um, Terry Branstad was the governor of Iowa um, and is now, or was re until recently, the ambassador, U.S. ambassador to China. So, you know, governors and ambassadors kind of sometimes cycle back and forth or go from being one to being the other. Um, and so it's very cool to see uh, some states where ambassadors have become governors uh, bring their knowledge of military to military cooperation that they gained while they're an ambassador to their state and then interface with their National Guard that way. Uh, and the reverse is also true, seeing someone go from being the governor of a state to now knowing, now you know that person is a major ambassador from the United States somewhere in the world and has deep knowledge of what specifically the National Guard can bring. Um, and so uh, Iowa Kosovo is another great example. Um, General Orr, who was the tag for a while there, talked about uh, specifically wanting to build a whole of Iowa to whole of Kosovo relationship um, and specifically connecting uh, cabinet level agencies in Iowa to ministries, you know, mostly, you know, economic and uh, trade ministries in Kosovo um, to, you know, facilitate exchange along all those different um, instruments of or elements of national power. Um, so otherwise, uh, in the 2000s and 2010s, um, a number of states deployed to combat together in um, NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, operational men and liaison teams, um, colloquially called omelets. Um, so Slovenia and Colorado, uh, Latvia and Michigan, Hungary and Ohio, Lithuania and Pennsylvania, Croatia and Minnesota, uh, and Bulgaria and Tennessee. Um, Azerbaijan and Oklahoma come together over energy extraction and research. Um, that's part of the reason why their you know partnership took yeah. off. Um, the state of Georgia has helped the Republic of Georgia develop their National Defense Academy in Tbilisi. Um, and then, you know, those are the highlights. But the real success story is that, you know, there are combatant commands where every country has an SPP partner, uh, and every combatant command has at least a few SPP partners, and our the number of partnerships are growing. Um, so that's that's the real success story is the day to day, persistent, long term military cooperation that's happening, building you know capability, interoperability, interoperability and familiarity between those two partners all over the world. When you kind of hit on this already, but you talked about we want states to, you know, or foreign states, sorry, to view the United States as like their security uh, cooperation partner of choice. I think that's the terminology you used there, but. You know, how does, you know, the, is the SPP program pretty competitive for entering new new states in? I know that, you know, Texas and Egypt, right, was the last the last one that happened. Yeah, there's a, there's a number of partnerships that are in the works right now. And um, there's a rate at which the National Guard Bureau, I think, um, thinks that they can grow the partnership. Um, a, a huge, you know, limiting factor on that, I think, is um, military, you know, paying allowances and also finding the time uh, amid, uh, I think- All these other requirements that we have. Yeah, our, our federal warfighting requirements, our responsibility to um, be responsive to state requests for support to civil authorities. Um, and this has been an unprecedented year for that with COVID responses, um, civil disturbance responses, um, and, and other responses in the individual states and territories. Uh, and then also our community mission. Um, there's a lot of strain on being able to provide more and more um, to kind of feed that beast. Uh, but I, when I talk to soldiers around the country and state partnership program directorates from the various states and territories, 
um, they they love it. You know, it's it's mm. it's travel, it's engagement, it's cultural exchange, um, and it's feeling like you're representing your country and your state to partners and allies around the world. And then when you finally get to convince, you know, you tell people that not only you're doing all those things, but you're also competing with our you know chief geopolitical competitors. Um, you're putting them on their back foot. You're making them perk up and take notice. Um, that you know that should make them feel even more proud of what they're doing. Uh, you know, at, at these combined exercises and going to these schools. Well, and I guess that led me right into what I was hoping we could talk about next, which is like the actual functions of a state partnership program. Um, like for instance, I know that you know state of Nebraska is partnered with. I think it's used to be the Czech Republic. Now Czechia is that the Czechia. Che- Chechia, did I say yeah, that? I think so. Maybe I might be saying it wrong. <laughs> so, um, you know, we've done a number of things with them. Can you kind of highlight for those that are unfamiliar what that looks like? You know, because you mentioned, you know, we're not training and equipping necessarily, but, you know, I guess what are the left and right limits of a uh, partnership program in real life? I understand it to be lowercase t training. Um, you know, there are formal programs that build partner capacity or uh, provide training um, either through U.S. military forces or um, U.S. Department of Defense or Department of State contractors. Um, And so not to get in the way of any of those programs, um, though I I think it might be aspirational, but the the integration of state partnership program with some of those programs uh, would would only help SPP get out there more uh, and in greater volume. Um, I think uh, it's focus on subject matter expert exchanges and uh, key leader engagements, um, which you can do a lot of, again, lowercase t training under that shield. And can you define that a little bit for those that are unfamiliar? Like what is lower key, lowercase t training? It, it, that's not a doctrinal term, um, but you know, lowercase t training, uh, things like um, working in collaboration with the partner country. Uh, so we have, you know, we have bilateral affairs officers out at the US embassies to some of those countries. Uh, we've got state partnership program directorates in each state and territory, and their job really is to work with their partners in those host nation, uh, partner nation militaries and assess their needs. What do they want? What do they want to learn from each state or territory? What capabilities does each state or territory bring? Some states bring you know, F-15s and F-16s. Uh, some states bring their emergency management agencies and people who are police in their civilian life, hum- Humvee mechanics, um, different um, non-commissioned officer education system schools. Uh, so it varies widely uh, and it's very uh, flexible based on what the two partners want to work on. And so at my level at the State Department, I see every quarter um, DOD has to notify to Congress the activities that are bringing in uh, specifically non-military personnel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I see, you know, prior to COVID, I see anywhere from a few dozen to a few hundred um, of these individual activities state by state, country by country a year. Uh, and they vary widely from um, one state bringing a bunch of people who are placement in their civilian lives to talk to that country that doesn't have much of a military, but has a very robust national police. Uh, and so, you know, talking about, well, this is this is how policemen operate in a you know country that um, you know, has a well-established rule of law, has civilian control of the military. Um, we, we've brought emergency management agencies to talk about response to natural disasters. Um, things like the National Incident Management System, um, Incident Command Centers um, and Incident Command Systems, um, Emergency Operation Center setups. Uh, so there's a lot of, especially through our Title 32 missions and our Defense Support to Civil Authorities missions in the Guard, um, there's a lot of great things that we can bring to countries that need it and want it um, that the the rest of the, the Title 10 U.S. military may be less familiar with. Okay. Um, so um, border security, um, you know, taking taking Central Asian states to the southwest border to. So from what I understand, then what you're saying is like a lot of the you know things that we that we do with that you know little T training is you know basically like enhancing and best practices between capabilities that already exist. Is that is that what I'm understanding? Yeah, definitely. Um, sharing, yeah, sharing best practices, familiarization, um, trading tactics, techniques, and procedures, um, and and sometimes bringing in civilian experts uh, or even like uh, I want to say, 
um, I might be wrong, but I think it was Montana, a landlocked state, brought in the U.S. Coast Guard from the neighboring district on the West mm -hmm. Coast um, because might have been Sri Lanka um, wanted to talk about littoral and riverine security. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's very flexible. Um, it's whatever the partners kind of design it to be, uh, and it is a lot of uh, knowledge sharing. I guess then on the on the don't side of things, is there any, you know, what are the things that uh, yeah, as guardsmen, when we're approaching these partnerships, we should avoid, you know, doing in those partnerships not to violate, you know, things that fall in the purview of the State Department or other agencies. Uh, I've never had to tell a state not to do anything. Um, there are, and part of the reason why it clears through the State Department is um, making sure that there are no policy uh, implications. Um, that kind of, that's why we review them quarter to quarter, and that's why I think the law directs that the activities are uh, notified to Congress quarterly. Um, but sometimes uh, it is um, it is brought up in the normal course of this coordination, uh, hey, it's not a good time to have this engagement with that country right now because we're talking to them about these you know, de democratic reforms uh, or um, the announcement of a partnership is on hold for whatever reason. Um, and so not much to tell you not to do at the soldier level or the airman level. Um, it typically happens at the, you know, four star or above level. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, the I guess the why behind the, the SPP program. We've talked about some examples, best practices and stuff. What's the feedback we've seen, I guess, first off from like the nation states um, that we've worked with? You know, around the world, um, or what are some benefits that you know have arisen from this, like third party, from your perspective, outside of that military uh, relationship from the State Department? I think generally, uh, countries love it. The countries that have partnerships love it, and uh, the partnerships are very sought after. Um, the ambassadors and uh, diplomats who are familiar with the program as a specific kind of brand of security cooperation, aside from what the rest of the the whole entire military brings. Um, they are, you know, very enthusiastic um, for it because it, again, it brings not just a striker cavalry regiment doing a, you know, a tour of Europe to that country, uh, but it brings a governor that can be brought in, a tag that can be brought in, you know, a few A tags that can be brought in, and a lot of different flavors of equipment and capability that can be brought in. So. Um, you know, countries love it because if, if you want to talk infantry brigade combat teams, there are states that can do that. You want to talk F-16 wings, there are states that can do that. Um, and so you have this kind of reach back to the diversity of the entire United States military uh, through the diversity of you know platforms and units in our Air Force and Army, uh, but you also have kind of familiarity and continuity that come from you're dealing with the same 16,000 people. Well, that was something I was going to ask you about. So like you know, you mentioned early on, like, how the Guard was well suited for this because we do everything from, you know, delivering COVID vaccines, right, to natural disasters to combat, you know. And so, you know, how do you have any examples, particular examples where you've seen, like, the Guard, you know, provide that military relationship, but also, you know, because they're all we're all civilians in, in some capacity or most of us are, you know, how that works um, with some of those cultural exchanges or things like that? Yeah, there are a lot of uh, police exchanges between uh, the Louisiana National Guard and, and the Haiti that I see, the Haitian National Police. Um, Central Asia, border security is kind of the name of the game. And so um, I think uh, many of the Central Asian states partners are um, out in the Mountain West or out in the Southwest. And so um, they can talk border security, especially the Southwestern states. Uh, and the Central Asian states partners uh, militaries come to the United States to tour our border, you know, facilities. Um, I've, I think it was Czech Republic and Texas um, consulted or they provided support uh, for COVID testing or vaccination. Hmm. Um, I didn't know that. I think so. Uh, so, yeah, they, they um, just the kind of diversity of Title 32 missions that the Guard can do and the civilian capabilities in our ranks. Um, SPP also loves to draw upon that. I guess then my last question, you mentioned some specific examples of your experience with, um, as a guardsman with your partner nation. 
early on in, the, in this interview. What's some feedback that you've seen from your role now at the State Department is like for feedback from guardsmen, I guess, who've engaged with these SPP programs in your experience? I think um, they, the soldiers, like, like, like I said, the, the soldiers love to feel like they're representing their, their state and their country um, doing security cooperation, um, that it's not just, you know, the theater component commands, you know, the, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps that are stationed out there or that do regular deployments to a region. Um, it's not just soft doing, you know, J sets or med readies or den, you know, den caps or vet caps or whatever. Uh, all these different um, engagements that those units do. Um, that someone who's a policeman in, you know, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, can go to Haiti and consult with a partner policeman um, in the Haitian National Police. Someone who's a, you know, an electrician can go to uh, basic leader course with you know, a Hungarian army officer in Columbus, Ohio. Um, the, the diversity of civilian occupations and, um, you know, Title 32 missions that we have experience in, you know, we, we deal with these things year in and year out, floods, uh, civil disturbance, um, pandemic response. Uh, our, our people are not only combat veterans or combat credible units, um, they're also very well experienced in uh, what, I, what I think in the United States is a very high-functioning DISCA construct. Uh, and so we can take your average you know, soldier who's run a bulldozer or a forklift or a, you know, run a distribution center for a food bank in Ohio, can then take that experience to their partner nation and say, hey, when your country calls on you to do this, you know, here's what I've done. Um, so uh, very, very relevant, very applicable. Um, and it's great that we can share that experience with you know, countries that need it. So, sir, you mentioned a couple times that, you know, the SPP program is one of those things that can put our near peer competitors, you know, on their back foot. Can you give us an example of like how the SPP program does that? Yeah, uh, it, so just the even the granting of a partnership um, shows our chief competitors in the world that there's no part of the world that will no ally or partner that will take for granted. Um, and we have the best trained soldiers in the world, the best equipped soldiers in the world. Um, our defense industry is the best in the world. Uh, and wherever our soldiers and airmen go, you know, they're, they're bringing with them kind of their examples of being a, a soldier or an airman um, in a system where the civilians control the military and we follow the rule of law. Uh, and our competitors can't do that. And so it, it, it frustrates them because all they can throw at those partners and allies um, are you know, shoddy military equipment, shoddy infrastructure projects, um, and and uh, private military contractors, uh, and so that's a I think a chief comparative advantage that we can bring when we bring the SPP to some of these, you know, crucial geopolitical choke points um, or strategic countries in the world uh, is um, it's another form and flavor of competition, uh, just as much as uh, foreign military sales, foreign military financing, or the actual capital T training of their you know their soldiers and officers um, is the bestowing that state partnership program partnership to them. So sir, before we dive into your final thoughts, what uh, for those states that are looking to expand those relationships with schools, um, is there opportunities there for soldiers to attend, you know, Americans uh, military schools and then vice versa for guardsmen to attend, you know, a training course that, you know, for, for example, like a, a jump program at, well, you know, a foreign entity puts on, you know, what have you seen with that in your experience up here at the State Department? Uh, so there's another program that deals specifically with military schools, with professional military education. It's a uh, very officer focused, okay. um, but it's called IMET, International Military Education and Training. Uh, and it kind of identifies those high potential uh, officers in partner nation. It's not tied to the SPP uh, okay. necessarily, so though. It's kind of a separate program. It is, yeah. Um, but it focuses on sending folks to, you know, things like the captain's career course, war college, um, intermediate leader education, um, PME courses like that, um, and also improving English language proficiency in partner nation and allied military forces. So, sir, as we wrap up here today, do you have any final thoughts for those uh, states out there who are developing their SBP partnerships on, you know, best practices? Yeah, I think foremost, take take a deep interest and encourage your soldiers and airmen to take a deep interest in your country's history, culture, 
language if you can. Um, tap into the diaspora communities that exist in your state and your National Guard uh, when you're either pursuing a, a new country nomination or starting a partnership with a country. Um, when I found out that I was going to be deploying with Hungary to Afghanistan, first thing I did, you know, after buying about $300 worth of books um, on Afghanistan and Hungary, was I called Ohio State University and I asked a professor um, of Hungarian language studies to spend a day with our unit uh, and, and just kind of help immerse us in Hungarian culture. And so she did that. She, uh, she made a Hungarian uh, dessert. Um, she told us, took us all through kind of like tactical language, you know, just the, the basics of, hi, hello, how are you? Um, told us about the history of, of mm -hmm. Hungary. Uh, and then the next weekend, I was able to line up a uh, Afghan professor um, from the same university to to come do the same for Afghanistan. And so um, the you know every every state that has you know multiple universities, diaspora communities, um, and every state and territory already has at least one state partnership program partner. Um, you can tap into those assets and and really bring them to bear to prepare your soldiers as best you can. Um, prior to their engagements. Also, there's a lot of strategy already written that you can kind of hang your, your engagements on. Mm -hmm. So I encourage uh, sp state partnership program directors, um, particularly, you know, make sure that your stuff is, is nested uh, in the national security strategy, national defense strategy, national military strategy, the theater campaign, um, the, the combatant command campaign plan, theater campaign order, um, the, you know, if there's a theater security cooperation plan, um, and also, um, you're not confined to just talking to people in your own state or Guard Bureau. Um, routinely, I field uh, calls and requests for information from individual SPPDs oh, really? um, who, you know, just want to know, hey, what's the status of this agreement? Um, what's the status of uh, certain talking points that they're not sure have been delivered yet or not? Um, I a few of them I have a good relationship with, I send cables to just to kind of keep them up to date on what's happening at the diplomatic level or mm. um, you know, at the national level with that country. Uh, and so the Department of State is always available to provide consultations. Uh, we can provide both regional and functional consultations to um, your SPP directors. So uh, when you come down to DC, you know, make sure I, I you know, probably check in with the joint staff, check in with OSD policy, check in with State Department and DIA. But um, you know, we can set up sit downs sometimes with individual country desks and state partnership program directorates. Um, we can also connect you with other functional bureaus within the Department of State that might be um, that might have more specific information, um, you know, based on what the U.S. government's concerns are with that country. So conflict and stabilization operations is a bureau that we can connect you with um, international security and nonproliferation. Um, arms verification and compliance, um, popula populations, refugees, and migration. Um, these are all different, you know, functional bureaus, uh, counterterrorism, um, democracy rights and labor, international narcotics and law enforcement. Um, these are all functions that exist within the U.S. government and within State Department that um, can help you better decide, um, you know, where you want to take your partnership and how you want to address the things that are of concern to your partner nation. Um, so there's a wealth of information down here. Uh, it's not inaccessible. Uh, you just got to reach out and, and, and know, where to, know where to go to get it. Well, sir, you've definitely been a wealth of information today. Awesome. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you so much for coming on today. And uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed having you, sir. Thanks for having me. This was great. If you would like more information on any of the topics discussed today, please visit our social media pages in the links below. Tune in to Leaders Recon over the next few weeks as we bring in today's leaders and pioneers to discuss their experiences, share their wisdom, and help you grow as a leader. If you like this episode of Leaders Recon, please don't forget to subscribe below and leave us a five-star review. You can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcast.